The Unshackled Waves, episode 141. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. What a huge week in Australian politics. We've just had released the 30th news poll loss in a row for Malcolm Turnbull. This has kicked off fresh leadership speculation with last week the uh, Monash Forum being formed, uh, made up of Conservative Coalition MPs wanting the federal government to build a new coal-fired power station. We also saw uh, from the Greens leader, Richard Di Natale, a renewed big government push. And we also saw Aboriginal activists attempt to steal the Commonwealth Games, which are being held on the Gold Coast at the moment. To discuss it all, we welcome back to the show, Associate Editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni. Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, Malcolm Turnbull has just lost his 30th consecutive uh, news poll, which was the same measure uh, he used to uh, justify his challenge against uh, Tony Abbott in September uh, 2015. There's been a lot of anticipation about this uh, 30th uh, news poll. Uh, Turnbull's lost it uh, 48 to 52 percent two-party uh, preferred. Uh, in in the lead up to this news poll, there was, of course, the formation of the uh, Monash Forum, which was uh, a group of conservative uh, coalition MPs who uh, published a letter uh, suggesting the Turnbull government uh, invest $4 billion in a new coal-fired power station in the Latrobe Valley. And there was also a Seven News uh, report that uh, even moderate MPs were beginning to desert Malcolm Turnbull's leadership. So it's happened now, the 30th poll, and uh, f- by the end of the week, uh, all the ministers and backbenchers are saying, look, there's no threat, oh, it's just a, uh, a news poll, but uh, he's reached the 30 now, and uh, f- when 31, 32, 33 happens, uh, th- you know, that's when the you know, leadership uh, question is going to intensify. Yeah, well, I think it's a matter of uh, when rather than if at this point. Um, more interestingly, I think it's also going to be quite fascinating in terms of uh, who it is exactly that uh, tries to roll Turnbull. So obviously Tony Abbott would be the, um, you know, the favourites pick, being uh, the former Prime Minister. Obviously there's a, a bit of history there, chip on his, on his shoulder, I would say. But at the same time, we're also uh, hearing rumours about Peter Dutton, for example, um, potentially having a go for the leadership and potentially even Julie Bishop. So I think that's where the... Um, where the, you know, the main controversy is going to play out ultimately. So, I mean, for me personally, I think that uh, Tony Abbott would be the, the more appropriate pick. And I think that, you know, he'd, he'd probably view himself that way as well, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, as I said, I, I think it's more or less a, a foregone conclusion at this point. And it's really just, you know, it's the nature of Australian politics that, you know, most prime ministers these days don't seem to see out the full term. We saw that with the the Rudd Gillard Rudd fiasco, and we've seen it now with the Liberal Party as well. So, like I said, I, I think it's really just a matter of if, uh, sorry, a matter of um, when rather than if. Yes, the the statistic is that uh, no prime minister since uh, John Howard has been able to serve out a full term as uh, prime minister. And speaking of John Howard, he uh, actually. Oh, had some form of an intervention this week when he was being interviewed on 7.30 with Lee Sales saying that there was no appetite for change. It would cause a whole uh, number of problems, which a lot of, it perplexed a lot of conservatives, given that Howard is himself a conservative and Turnbull's a a moderate, but they've always had this, you know, bizarre uh, political uh, friendship. And it's interesting that uh, he's intervened in this way to, you know, save Turnbull, but not Abbott. He didn't actually speak up uh, until the day after Abbott was rolled as Prime Minister. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting that you should mention that. I mean, obviously, John Howard and uh, Tony Abbott also have quite a uh, an intimate relationship, based on my understanding. Um, but I think at this point in time, Howard is probably just uh, coming out in support of Turnbull because he would view it as being in the best interest of the nation. So, I mean, this is a man who served as our Prime Minister for, I think it was 11 years in total, 96 to 2007. So I think that... You know, in saying that, I, I would assume that he's just looking out for the best interests of the Australian people. Uh, having said that, um, you know, it's just the nature of Australian politics these days that 
you know, there's going to be a challenge. I think it's inevitable at this point in time that we will see a challenge for the Liberal leadership and therefore the Australian Prime Ministership um, before the next federal election. Uh, but yeah, as you said, it's, it's quite a scary thought, really, to think about it, that uh, John Howard was the last Prime Minister to serve out his entire term. So it's really, it's, you know, it's quite pathetic to think that Australia has actually reached that point where our democracy is that unstable. Well, the argument is that uh, our leaders uh, aren't as good as uh, John Howard. And it was interesting in that interview, Howard also made the observation that there was no Facebook and Twitter when he was prime minister. And obviously the 24 hour media cycle likes to, you know, drum up this, you know, leadership uh, drama scandal uh, at all, all the opportunity. But I um, lean towards the argument that we just haven't had that uh, good quality of, of leader over the, uh, over the past decade. And that's, you know, summed up by our economic uh, situation, this energy crisis that we're in and all the other problems we have. Yeah, I think you're seeing it from uh, both sides of politics as well in, in the Liberal Party and in the Labor Party. We just don't have the, uh, you know, the calibre of leaders that we used to. I mean, if you look back at the, the 1980s, for example, when the Labor Party had the likes of uh, Paul Keating and um, Bob Hawke and, you know, obviously John Howard in the 1990s and 2000s. I would argue that politicians of that caliber just don't exist anymore. And I think it's a, an absolute shame, to be honest with you, that, you know, you can see it in both parties that they've just been overrun with opportunists. I mean, Malcolm Turnbull was a, a man who, you know, he entered uh, parliament in, I believe it was the 2004 election after stacking his branch. You've got Bill Shorten who weaseled his way into the Labor Party via the um, the trade union movement. And I think that from both of them, they're really just more interested in serving them, their own egos more so than actually serving the Australian people. Yeah, well, Malcolm Turnbull, he'd made, you know, all the money there is to be made. And he was like, what else can I do? Become a prime minister. Exactly. Um, actually, I read a book uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was called uh, The Education of a Young Liberal. So it was outlining the experience of a a uh, young Liberal staffer who was involved in the New South Wales branch of the Liberal Party at that point in time. And it was quite interesting to uh, to actually hear firsthand about the, um, you know, some of the things that happened behind the scenes in relation to Malcolm Turnbull stacking the Wentworth branch. Um, and it's, you know, it's quite fascinating really to look back at that particular book and then, you know, contrast with modern day Australia and looking what um, you know, what Malcolm Turnbull is actually doing these days in terms of having nice Tony Abbott and, um, you know, the fact that he's he's essentially, he's had a prime ministership that hasn't really been defined by anything. I mean, if we look back on virtually any other prime minister, we can see that they, you know, they've achieved something. They've achieved an actual out outcome of some sort, some sort of achievement in the area of policy. Whereas with Malcolm Turnbull, I just... For me, anyway, nothing comes to mind. A lot of people might say gay marriage, but yeah, I don't really, you know, I just, I don't think that he's a man of true conviction. I think that he's just someone who just likes power for the sake of power more so than anything else. Uh, going back to that uh, Seven News report, which was done by uh, Mark Riley, who, you know, is no uh, conservative, he's, he's suggested that the moderate MP's uh, strategy uh, is to uh, wait until after the budget, see how that's received, which, given Turnbull manages to mess up uh, everything, is, uh, you know, li likely to see the government continue to lose in the polls. Uh, and the strategy is uh, during the parliamentary killing season, which is around June, that's where both Rudd and uh, Gillard uh, got knifed. They'll install a new leader then and then aim to go for elect an election uh, after the footy finals in uh, early October so they can take advantage of the, the honeymoon. They'd probably still lose the, the federal election, but you know, set themselves up for you know, losing by not too much and then uh, back in the game next election. Yeah, I mean, we're getting um, <clears throat> bombarded with elections these days, aren't we? Uh, it was only two years ago that we had a federal election. And yeah, as you say, it's looking like we're going to be having a, another one this year, potentially. Um, now, as you say, you know, June would probably be the, the opportune moment for someone to strike. But like I said before, it'll be interesting to see who specifically that person is. Now, like I said, my money is on Tony Abbott. Um, how about you, Tim? Who do you think would be most likely to have a play for the uh, Liberal Party leadership? 
I, I think they'll go to one of the, the new generation. I mean, uh, t- Tony Abbott is pretty much despised by you know most of his uh, colleagues now. They view him as a, a, a wrecker. And there was that infamous um, uh, Daily Telegraph article where one uh, f- uh, government uh, minister was quoted as, uh, uh, fuck him, he's a dog-whistling piece of shit. Uh, so, yeah, they. Uh, I, I think they'd rather... You know, even some of the more conservative-leaning ones would rather, like, drink bleach than make Tony Abbott uh, Prime Minister again. So I think they'd go to New Generation. The moderates would obviously go to, uh, you know, Julie Bishop. Uh, another name that's been thrown around is Christopher Pine. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Christopher Pine as pri- a Prime Minister. Uh, obviously, on the, the conservative side, the choices are better with Scott Morrison, uh, though he, he was uh, damaged... Uh, somewhat in the the 2015 uh, leadership uh, changeover. Obviously, Peter Dutton is, in my opinion, the the standout choice. I mean, he's been uh, a stalwart in uh, immigration and you know home affairs. He's you know he's been loyal to Turnbull, but you know he's done the the head kicking. You know, pissed off the lefties. You know, he's described as the most evil man on the on the left wing websites, and he's just being you know un- unapologetic. You know, champion the cause of the uh, South African uh, farmer. So I reckon he's the sort of you know firebrand. You know, you need to revive the coalition. Yeah, well, I mean, I look. I was a little bit skeptical about um, about you know the appropriateness of Dutton as a leader going back a few years. I remember there were a few gaffes. Um, one yeah, he mind, wasn't was a, a good health mis- minister. Yeah, well, I mean, you you, you can probably recall that uh, that incident where there was a um, a microphone um, oh, hanging yeah. above them, and I'm uh, sorry, a boom mic, I should say, and it was um, there was something caught on the audio him making some sort of joke that he wasn't meant to be making. Yeah, he, he, t- he um, talked about Cape York time. That's right, yeah, something like that. Anyway, so I, yeah, I think at that point in time, I, you know, I didn't really think much of the guy, but I, I got to say he's grown on me. Um, ever since he's come into the, uh, the immigration portfolio, I think that my perception of him has improved. And yeah, as you say, I think he's, he's really done a great job of, you know, bringing the plight of the South African farmer into the mainstream of Australian politics. Yeah, and we should talk a bit about this uh, Monash uh, forum because uh, it's being described as being spearheaded by what's known as the the AAA team, which is Tony Abbott, Kevin Andrews, and uh, Erica Betts. Uh, now there was you know a huge outrage about you know them using the name uh, Monash, which is uh, uh, named after Sir John Monash, who. Uh, he was an uh, engineer. Uh, he he was a uh, World War One commander, and he was also uh, chairman of the the state uh, electricity board, which helped uh, get coal fired power up in Victoria. The more I hear about Monash, the more I think he was some sort of superhuman, like he did so much as a as a person. But some you know descendants of him are saying like, how dare you? Uh, you know you uh, they don't they don't uh, they conceded they don't have ownership of the name, but I don't think you know they would know more about, you know, what uh, Sir John Monash would think uh, these days than any other student of history. And it's interesting, they're, they're happy with the, the Monash name to be attached to Monash University, which, as we've seen, is engaging in a advertising campaign full of left-wing activism. Exactly. I mean, you raise a valid point there that, you know, obviously Monash University has released, uh, you know, this controversial new advertising campaign. Now, I mean, if that's... Um, you know, within the bounds of acceptability, according to the Monash family, then surely naming a, um, you know, a, an interest group within the Liberal Party after John Monash, surely that's, you know, somewhat innocent by comparison. I think if anything, this really just sheds light on the political leanings of the descendants of uh, John Monash more so than anything else. Uh, now, uh, f- um, after your opinion, is, you know, the Monash group, is it more about just, you know, shit stirring or do they, you know, is it about a genuine uh, point of public policy? Well, yeah, based on my understanding, um, I think it's really just a, a matter of timing from these particular members of parliament. Um, obviously, this uh, an- anti-Turnbull or anti-moderate sort of sentiment has existed in the Liberal Party for some time and, you know, the knifing of Tony Abbott didn't exactly help things in that regard. But I think the fact that uh, this particular interest group has gone public at a time when, um, you know, there's questions being asked about Malcolm Turnbull's leadership, I definitely think that there is a 
uh, you know, an organized sort of um, strategy at play here. Now, the fact that the, uh, you know, the organization or the interest group itself is um, focused on a particular policy, which would contradict that which is being um, advocated for by the Turnbull government, I think is also quite interesting. So based on my understanding, the, uh, the Monash Forum wants um, uh, more or less more government involvement in, uh, in the, the coal industry. So effectively uh, a move away from a market-based sort of a mechanism towards more of a, uh, a state-based um, uh, emphasis on, on the coal industry, which I, you know, I find quite interesting, the fact that you know, this is more or less the party of free enterprise and it's moving towards more of a, uh, a statist sort of an, an emphasis. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing necessarily. I'm not exactly um, the biggest fan of free market economics these days, but uh, nonetheless, it's um, it's almost a little bit paradoxical to think that that's the, you know, the Liberal Party or, you know, a group of MPs within the Liberal Party that's advocating for that particular stance. Uh, I sort of get their point that uh, the fr- uh, free market, the energy market, has been so distorted by you know, uh, uh, subsidies that, and you know, given that business is expecting a, a Labor government after the next election, uh, who in their right mind would want to invest in you know, a new coal-fired power station given that uh, policy uh, uncertainty? And it's also you know, worth uh, highlighting that you know, most corporations these days love to virtue signal about climate change and you know, AGL, they, they had that advertising campaign who owned the Liddell power station saying, you know, we're getting out of coal and, and they won't sell the, the power station. And it seems they just want to basically, because uh, they say they want to keep it to, you know, get it away for parts or something. It just seems like they just want to, you know, destroy it uh, c- completely so nobody can, you know, ever have, you know, that, that coal ability again. Yeah, well, I I think there's obviously a you know a bit of um, business strategy at play here. It's also probably largely motivated from um, you know a PR point of view, I suppose. Um, but yeah, at the same time, um, obviously the the fact that these particular MPs are advocating for this stance um, and the you know the timing of it as well, I think that it's it does speak volumes about um, you know some of the conversations that are happening behind the scenes within the coalition. Uh, and so it's uh, tomorrow there most members of the government are going to be treating uh, this as an ordinary day it's interesting that Tony Abbott's polypedal is going to be in the Latrobe Valley uh, but uh, by coincidence where they want to build this new uh, a coal-fired power station uh, but of course the the great paradox in these uh, polls and the the government's going to keep losing is that uh, voters even coalition voters want Turnbull to remain as leader, so they're they're basically trapped uh, uh, liberal MPs in this losable position uh, with not much of a path out. Yeah, I mean, you raise a valid point, though. Obviously, the the polling does suggest that he's the preferred leader, so it might even it might even point to a uh, a larger issue that the electorate has with the party itself. So perhaps there is uh, some sort of need for a, a cultural change or even a rebirth of the party if it is to remain, um, you know, relevant and, and, um, and viable within uh, the context of Australian politics. Now, it wasn't just the Monash Forum proposing a new policy this week. Uh, Greens leader Richard Di Natale fronted the National Press Club this week to unveil the Greens' uh, economic uh, manifesto, which uh, contains a, a people's uh, bank, which would offer low-interest uh, housing loans, and he also advocated a universal basic income, or UBI, which any person would would get in Australia guaranteed and it would not be means-tested. Other policies that the Greens have introduced this year is the phasing out of the sale of, or should I say ban on the sale of petrol and uh, diesel cars by uh, 2030. And let's not forget their uh, campaign to change the date uh, of Australia Day. So the Greens... uh, uh, I mean, the Liberal Party, they've been lurching to the left, but, you know, <laughs> the Greens are, you know, going off the off the left cliff. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you raise a valid point that it obviously is a, an emphasis, or it, I, I suppose based on a surface level sort of an analysis, it's a, an emphasis on, you know, fiscal irresponsibility and, you know, virtue signalling in some cases. But you do raise the, um, the point of the uh, universal basic income. Now, it is... 
as far as I'm concerned, it's a bit of a um, almost a misconception, I suppose, amongst many people that that particular policy, the UBI, is um, is necessarily going to be a, a you know a left wing point of view. I mean, for example, the the great free market economist Milton Friedman, he actually advocated for a, a universal basic income. So, uh, based on my understanding, the idea is that you would abolish all other forms of welfare, and that a, a UBI, which is you know, which there's no means testing associated with it, that would then replace all forms of welfare. So, in doing so, you would, um, you know, you you create a, a safety net for everyone. So, you'd have more uh, more potential for you know, entrepreneurialism and, you know, people would be more likely to take risks in that case. Um, so I, you know, I think that there's not really, um, I suppose the, the reception of that particular policy, I don't think it's really been, uh, met with good faith. I mean, I, I don't say this as a, you know, as someone who would be defending the Greens necessarily, but I think that that particular policy, I think it's, you know, it's worth discussing, I think on a, a deeper intellectual level than just what we've seen so far, which is, you know, as far as I can tell, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party just dismissing it as, you know, fiscally reckless and, and all this sort of thing. In fact, I, I'm under the impression that uh, I think in Switzerland, they recently had a, a referendum in relation to introduce, uh, introducing a, a universal basic income, which was successful. Um, and once again, the, um, you know, the rhetoric surrounding the debate, it needs to be more nuanced than just this, you know, this simplistic sort of dismissal of it as being some sort of you know, fiscally irresponsible sort of a policy. Well, the main reason that people, you know, regard it as fiscally irresponsible is because, you know, you can't have it if it, you know, disincentivizes, you know, people finding work or taking on more work. I mean, this is the, the balancing act. Like, most people agree you've got to have some sort of uh, safety net, but it's got to be, you know, less than, you know, what you'd be able to get uh, in the in the private sector, and the when when people see you know uh, Richard Di Natale proposing universal basic income, you know you can guarantee the the Greens who already want to you know increase the the New Start uh, allowance uh, significantly. It would be you know at a, at a level which would you know uh, incentivize people to you know basically just uh, live live off the government. Yeah, well, I think it depends on what other policies they introduce um, to go along with it. So, obviously, if they introduce the UBI and, um, you know, decide to also maintain the current forms of welfare, then, yeah, I think that would be quite fiscally reckless. But as I mentioned before, there are many economists on the right, so free market economists, you know, Milton Friedman, just to name one, who would advocate for uh, removing or abolishing all other forms of welfare and only having the UBI. Uh, now, based on my understanding, I think that the the Greens uh, manifesto stated that they wanted a UBI of somewhere around twenty grand a year, or somewhere thereabouts. So it's obviously far less than the uh, the average wage in Australia. Um, so I, you know, I don't really buy this argument that it's um, you know incentivizing people to be um, you know to not do anything and just just leech off the government. I think for most people, they would, as well as receiving the UBI, most people would still have an incentive to work harder in order to earn more than that 20 grand a year. I mean, as it currently exists, you can make the same argument in relation to any form of welfare. You know, the new start, as you mentioned before, the new start allowance, uh, you know, potentially people could argue that that would disincentivize work. Um, but, you know, that's obviously not the case. Most people want to earn more than that, you know, that basic low level of income. And, you know, um, as long as you introduce a UBI, which is you know, relatively low, I think that you wouldn't necessarily be uh, removing any sort of incentives for people to work and, you know, start businesses and innovate, as far as I'm concerned. Let's look at uh, Dean Natale's other proposal, which is uh, People's Bank. And uh, yeah, in my opinion, uh, this would, uh, it's this kind of, you know, uh, underwriting of um, housing loans, which caused the, the gl uh, global financial crisis in the United States, which uh, Freddie May and 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 Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, I, I believe is uh, what they're called. Um, basically, because the government was underwriting all these loans, you know, at uh, and this was assisted by uh, legislation which uh, uh, 
uh, made sure that you know banks uh, gave you know loans to you know low income people who had no chance of uh, paying it back. And it's interesting that we're having this Banking Royal Commission, which basically uh, discusses. Uh, uh, banks giving loans to people who had, you know, no chance to pay it back, and Di Natale says that's bad, but he's uh, proposing that a government bank do that, and that's apparently okay. Yeah, so based on my understanding of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I, I believe that that was more so um, legislation which uh, more or less forced private banks to, to uh, loan money to subprime uh, borrowers. Whereas a, a people's bank would be, yeah, as you say, entirely government operated. Um, now, yeah, I mean, as, as you point out, you'd still have more or less the same uh, mechanisms existing. And yeah, you would essentially have a, a massive bubble created. Having said that, I think if if these people banks hypothetically were to um, you know, be responsible enough to lend money to the right people and make you know rational decisions in that regard, I think that's where the key really lies, whether or not these banks are are managed by uh, responsible individuals. So I think that the uh, the sort of people who they recruit to to manage you know, the so-called People's Bank, hypothetically, if it were to be implemented, I think that that's really where the emphasis needs to lie in relation to this particular policy. Oh, you're sounding very sympathetic to this manifesto, Tom. <laughs> As I said, I just I think that you know a little bit a little bit more nuance in relation to it is is necessary. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I I'm the first person to sink the boot into the greens but at the same time i think you've got to do it for the right reasons so as i said before with the ubi you need to consider what you know what other forms of welfare are going to be abolished or maintained um simultaneously when this policy is introduced and it's the same thing with the people's bank there's potential there for it to be a disaster but you know potentially there's also the um uh you know the right intention there i mean we've seen with the the Royal Commission into into banking. There's obviously a lot of corruption which exists there within the private sector, and I don't think that the nationalisation of banks is necessarily um, a far left policy, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you could potentially, as a nationalist or a conservative, argue in favour of the nationalisation of banks. Um, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, a bank is essentially a mechanism which encourages uh, speculation and. Um, you know, there's not really an emphasis on any sort of actual societal output. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, an industry such as finance or banking is sort of, I suppose, uh, separate from the, you know, the actual economy itself, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but no, I obviously I'm not exactly um, going to be voting for the Greens in the next election. But like I said, I think that, um, you know, we've got to be uh, intellectually honest in terms of how we uh, analyze and interpret these policies. It's interesting that you say, oh, you know, they're well-intentioned policies, but, you know, as we've seen, you know, good intentions don't lead to, you know, good policy outcomes. And you mentioned there if it's done right uh, when, you know, government tries, you know, these massive, uh, you know, government, you know, corporations, as we've seen with the, you know, NBN uh, rollout, government, you know, almost, you know, 99% of the time manages to, you know, stuff it up. And I, I would defend the, the private, you know, banking sector because, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you want... Uh, you know, banks to be, you know, prudent when ha handing out loans to make sure because, you know, people need, <clears throat> people need uh, enough, you know, to have enough income to, you know, buy a house. Uh, and, you know, banks that obviously if a person succeeds in paying off their house, it's a, it, it's a win-win. And, you know, houses being, you know, foreclosed on because people haven't been, you know, paid it back, you know, that collapses the, the property market. I mean, you know, look what happened in the United States with, you know, these uh, houses which were, uh, you know, worthless. Uh, I think, you know, a people's bank would, you know, just grant, you know, loans, you know, willy-nilly and the, the taxpayer would be on the, the, the foot for, you know, all this irresponsible lending. Well, yeah, once again, not necessarily. I, you know, I would, I'd probably place more of an emphasis on who specifically is running these banks. Um, so, for example, I mean, if it's a a Greens policy, chances are that they would probably appoint someone who would be more, um, you know, favourable or sympathetic towards their particular ideals and would therefore support this, you know, this idea of loaning money to virtually anyone. Uh, having said that, though, if you look at you know, the history of banks in Australia, I mean, Commonwealth Bank, for example, used to be owned by the government at one point in time. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, as long as you appoint the right person, a people's owned or a government owned bank is not necessarily going to be 
uh, fiscally irresponsible. I mean, for example, if a, a fiscal conservative became the Prime Minister of Australia, surely they would appoint, um, you know, a, a person to manage this bank who is, you know, going to be on the same the same wavelength as them. So I, yeah, I think you you really do need to emphasise. Um, you know, the finer detail in relation to this particular policy. So like I said, I'm, you know, for me personally, I'd be open to the idea of a people's bank, but it's just, it's really just a matter of how exactly the bank is, is run and how it's managed. Um, I think that that's where the, um, you know, the important detail in relation to this policy really lies. Well, I think the way to solve housing affordability is just to release more land, build more houses. I mean, it's a, it's a supply issue for me. It's not a, uh, a factor, you know, Labor with their negative gearing policy believes that, you know, the rich are, you know, hoarding, you know, all the houses. You know, Australia is a large country. We can, you know, build more. We can build up. Um, you know, that's uh, uh, that's not the, the issue. Uh, the ish problem we have i'm um, i mean it's it's basically we need to you know unlock uh the housing market so you know we can have you know more of uh, you know more people that drags the price of housing down and um you know the as it's called the the great australian dream can uh be in reach of more people now of course a lot of existing homeowners you know don't like that because it decreases the the value of their property but uh if, if it's a choice between you know uh, rich people having, you know, high value houses or more people into, you know, their own home, I'd pick that. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you raise the issue of housing affordability in Australia. Um, I mean, even if we were to, as you say, you know, uh, build up or, you know, make more land um, available to build on, I still don't think that you're really solving the, you know, the issue which, which exists there. Uh, so, for example, if you do uh, build more units and you know you, you related this back to the idea of the Australian dream for me the Australian dream is owning a, a home with a big backyard where you can you know play cricket and footy with your kids and you just you're not going to get that with unit living uh, likewise if you build out I mean where do you draw the line are we going to become like Los Angeles in Melbourne and Sydney are we going to be you know living 50 kilometers from the CBD you've got to draw the line somewhere and as far as I'm concerned uh, immigration is really at the core of this particular issue I mean, currently in Australia, we have an unsustainable immigration policy. It's somewhere between two and 300,000 people immigrating to Australia each year. And, you know, obviously that is going to, um, you know, it's going to place a strain on housing affordability. So I think this idea of, you know, freeing up land and, you know, building more housing, um, you know, obviously you are addressing one aspect of the issue. But for me, I think that if we're, if we're going to have an honest debate in relation to housing affordability, I think that immigration is is probably the most pressing issue which needs to be addressed. Now let's turn to the politics of uh, Di Natale's uh, policies. Now, uh, a lot of people are suggesting this is aimed up to uh, shore, shore up his leadership following the, the Batman by-election loss, which uh, a lot of people believe that you know the hard left of the Greens uh, sabotaged but, uh, there with all these allegations that the the candidate Alec, Alex Batar was you know bully uh, branch stacker and this is you know Di Natale who sold himself as a centrist now you know going to the left to, to make sure that you know he can rally the green space behind him yeah um, so as you pointed out there obviously the yeah the Batman by-election did um, you know it's sort of brought into the public eye some of these uh, rival rivalries which exist within the Greens, um, some of the factualism within that party it does get a, a little bit messy at times. But what we did see when Richard Di Natale gained the uh, the leadership from, um, sorry, her name escapes me, who was Christine the, the Milne. Green, Christine Millen, of course. Um, so yeah, when when he gained the leadership from her, we saw almost like a I suppose a rebranding of the Greens. They went away from being this you know, crazy far left party and they sort of, you know, they modernized. They were suddenly appealing to, you know, professionals and, you know, business owners and all that. And I just, I don't think it's possible for a party that has the likes of, you know, Rick, Lee Rhiannon, for example, Sarah Hansen Young, for a party like that to try to sell themselves as a, you know, reasonable centrist sort of an alternative. I just, I don't think it's uh, realistic. I mean, full respect to Richard Di Natale. I think he comes across as a lot more reasonable than most of the other people in his party. Um, but he's just, yeah, he's trying to sell a brand of politics, which just doesn't sit well with the, um, with some of the, the base of his party, unfortunately. 
Now, the Commonwealth Games are underway on the Gold Coast, and uh, a, a lot of people uh, like the Commonwealth Games because Australia wins uh, a lot of gold medals, but uh, some others think it's a you know, joke because you know, it's just so easy for us to uh, win at uh, everything. But uh, f as we saw with Australia Day, uh, the Commonwealth Bang Games has been hijacked uh, by uh, Aboriginal activists who've labelled it the, the Stolen Wealth Games because it's, you know, the, the Commonwealth uh, represents uh, colonialism. Uh, so they uh, blocked the, uh, the Queen's uh, baton on the, the opening ceremony day and tried to break into the opening ceremony itself, which actually did its uh, best to, you know, placate uh, these activists. But there was, you know, so many parts dedicated to, you know, Aboriginal uh, culture and uh, Alan Jones and Pauline Hanson were particularly critical, saying, you know, sure, it's, you know, part of our history, but, you know, it's basically occupying, you know, half of this... Um, this ceremony when it, you know it's supposed to be about you know the the gold coast uh in particular and so uh they've tried to these aboriginal activists yeah they've labeled it the stolen wealth games i think that they have actually stolen the games these activists and really ruined what should be a uniting uh event for our country yeah well, i mean it's you know it's always a given isn't it when there's any sort of major event held in australia that we always you know, we give lip service to this, um, you know, this particular agenda. We always roll out the red carpet for them, and it never seems to be enough, unfortunately. Uh, I I even remember, I think it was the, the Sydney Olympics in 2000 had uh, similar sort of um, things going on at the, the opening ceremony. So I think it's really just a given uh, these days. But, yeah, I mean, you raise the, the issue of the protesters, um, you know, disrupting some of the, uh, some of the events, and... Um, yeah, I mean, it really does just speak volumes about that particular community, as far as I'm concerned. And like I said, they've been enabled by, you know, they'll placate it in the opening ceremony and this uh, uh, tent embassy that it's... Uh, it's uh, being organised by, I think it's the Brisbane Sovereign, Sovereign Aboriginal uh, Embassy and also the Warriors of Aboriginal Resistance. Who, le let's not remember, you know, what they said uh, on Australia Day. Uh, fuck Australia. Hope it uh, fucking burns to the ground. Uh, so, you know, we know, um, you know, what these pe people are like. And the more you enable them, the more, you know, their, their demands are going to get. I mean, you know, protesting, you know, Prince Charles and... Uh, uh, Duchess Camilla saying, you know, as, you know, representatives of the Crown, you know, they, uh, they're collectively responsible for, you know, all the, you know, disadvantage that, you know, Aboriginal, you know, pe uh, uh, people face. Uh, again, that's the left with their, you know, collective guilt and you're responsible for uh, the actions of your ancestors, even though, you know, Prince Charles, you know, during his, you know, reign as Prince of Wales has, you know, been an advocate for, you know, social justice and minorities in the, in the United Kingdom. Of course, that's uh, never enough. And I love this term, you know, stolen wealth games. What did, it, it, it's more like, you know, the, the, the crown, which they're protesting again, it was under the crown's government that they actually built everything here, created the wealth. They didn't, you know, steal anything. The, mo most of the land had nothing on it. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to see uh, almost like an alternative view of Australian history, like what would have happened in this country if the British hadn't come here. I mean, either it would be a Japanese colony by now or an Indonesian colony, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, realistically, even if someone didn't invade it, it would just be a third world country. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think this whole narrative of, you know, trying to shame the British, trying to shame the royal families if they've done something wrong, by creating this beautiful nation. I just think it's absurd. I mean, we're so lucky to be living in, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest country on the face of this planet. So the fact that anyone would want to um, undermine that and you know, dismiss everything that Australia represents, is just, it's quite sad, really. Um, I think these people need to wake up to themselves, maybe spend some time living in a, a third world country and see for yourselves just how, how lucky we really are to be living in this beautiful nation. And the Commonwealth Games, it's made up of, you know, countries which are, you know, republics now. I mean, India participates happily in the, the Commonwealth Games, and let's not forget, you know, their struggle for uh, independence, yet, you know, they don't hold a, you know, grudge against the, the British, you know, they they love uh, cricket, which is a, you know, British game, and, you know, they're happy to, happy to come along. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the specific Indian, to be honest with you. I've spoken to some Indians who have uh, very negative uh, sort of feelings towards the, um, you know, the British and the whole the whole concept of colonialism. So, I, yeah, I think it depends on the individual. But, no, you do raise a valid point that uh, I would think that India as a collective have more or less embraced British culture, obviously, in terms of you know, sport and, you know, the English language. Um, and, you know, this is a nation who they were they were under British rule for a lot longer as well, comparatively speaking. Um, so, yeah, with that in mind, I think that, uh, you know, if you compare, uh, you know, the, the fact that they've been able to move on, if you compare that to the, you know, the attitude demonstrated by, uh, by the Australian Indigenous people, it does, it really does speak volumes as far as I'm concerned. And I don't understand why these activists, they've got, you know, Dylan Voller as, what, you know, one of their uh, activists. I mean, the, the te- oh, he's, no, uh, he's an adult now, but, you know, he, um, you know, is a, a criminal. I mean, you know, he, you know, bashed a, a man while high, you know, on ice. And, you know, let's not forget the reason why he was in that spit hood is because, you know, he, he was basically, you know, uh, violent and, you know, atta- uh, you know uh, disruptive in, in jail. And he was put in that, you know, for, you know, his own, um, you know, protection. So I don't get, you know, why you you'd want, you know, somebody, you know, like that to, you know, be your spokesperson who has that, you know, criminal background and basically has, you know, never really apologised. Yeah, well, there does seem to be some sort of a, an active campaign to almost make this guy a bit of a celebrity. Uh, I mean, the fact that we're talking about him right now is evidence of that. Now, as you say, he's, you know, if you look at his background, he's a violent criminal. He's done some some horrible, disgusting things to innocent people. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, he shouldn't really be given any sort of, you know, public platform, any sort of attention. Um, you know, he should be locked in prison as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, oh, I'm sure um, this isn't the last uh, event that these Aboriginal activists will, will protest at. I mean, well, Australia Day is only, what, nine months m- months away. <laughs> they've got um, yeah. uh, They've got, you know, fresh things to be outraged about. Oh, exactly. It's it's never ending. Uh, we'll probably still this, be seeing the same thing, you know, 50, 60, 70 years from now. So it's, yeah, it's no surprise as far as I'm concerned. Oh, well, thanks, Tom, for coming back on the, the show, show today. Um, th- thanks once again for your uh, yeah, weekly contributions on the, the Unshackled, and you're welcome back on the show anytime. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's been a pleasure. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'd like to remind everyone about the upcoming events The Unshackled will be present at. There's the Justice for Jalal rally. Jalal was a 13-year-old boy who was hit and killed by an unlicensed African driver who only received 80 hours community service. It will be on Sunday the 15th of April at 1pm at Victoria's Parliament House. There is also the Rally Against Safe Schools on Saturday the 21st of April at 1pm, also at Victoria's Parliament House. It is uh, being held to coincide with the National Sex Ed Sit-Out on Monday the 23rd of April to take a stand against uh, safe schools, respectful relationships and other programs which sexualise our children. So I hope you can join us for both of those in the Melbourne area as people on the right, they need to get out onto the streets to make the politicians take note. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash theunshackled. Also, don't forget our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other great gear for right-thinking people. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.